Uh, we will wait another um, minute or so and we will start. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for attending. We're on time, so uh, we will start the webinar. Uh, my name is Michal Halbert, and I'm the leading, uh, leading the academic engagement GFI in Israel. Good to have you here. Just a minute. Okay. So today's webinar is focused on GFI Alternative Protein Research Grant. We will start with an overview of the research grant program and the RFP. For that, we invited Austin and Erin from Team GFI US. Austin is the Scientific Research Funding Coordinator, and Erin is the Associated Director of Science and Technology. Thank you both very much for being here. Uh, we also have with us today Tom Benarier, the Senior Scientist of GFI Israel. Hi, Tom. Uh, after the presentation, we will have time for Q&A. So please load your questions in the Q&A space and we will have time uh, to address all, all them after the presentation. I recommend maybe to wait with the questions to the end because I'm sure Austin will um, at least address some of them during his presentation. Before we begin, for those of you who are less familiar with the work of GFI, I would like to give a really quick introduction GFI is an international nonprofit organization focused on accelerating the shift to a better food system. We are doing uh, that by accelerating plant-based, cultivated, and fermentation-based meat, eggs, and dairy products, uh, what we call as uh, alternative protein products. GFI has teams all around the globe, in Israel, United States, Europe, Asia Pacific, India, Brazil. We work on three domains science and technology, where we focus on advancing science. We are working with the academic institutions, researchers and students to promote alternative protein research and innovation. We provide scientific resources and we have an uh, alternative protein academic course. We have funding opportunities and we're working on growing the alternative protein community. Our work in the corporate engagement domain is in advancing entrepreneurs and alternative protein startups, as well as large food companies. We provide advisory, networking opportunities and relevant resources. And our policy work is focused mainly on regulation issues and maximizing uh, government funding support. Um, this is really um, in brief. Uh, if you would like to hear more about the work, I really invite you to contact us um, for more information on or any other issue or question, and we would be happy to meet and assist. And of course, to follow us on social media and through our newsletter and stay updated with the latest news. Um, thank you very much. That's for me. And now I will pass it on to you, Austin. And I will stop my share. So you can share yours. You're on mute. How about now? <laughs> okay, great. Thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, really appreciate that. And I believe you should be able to see my screen. Is that correct? Yes. Wonderful. Great. So uh, as Michal mentioned, um, I am just going to give a quick overview of GFI's competitive uh, grant program and the research funding that GFI has kind of offered to date and really what that means for you as a researcher and as a community. So uh, there'll be four high level areas of this talk and I'll keep it relatively short because I understand that your questions are really um, a great opportunity. We have lots of experts here and hopefully we can make a good use of that time together. First, I'd love to take a look at what GFI's goals are with funding research overall. And as McCulloch mentioned briefly, what GFI does generally is we work to develop a healthy, just and sustainable food uh, system and a food future. We do that primarily through innovation in alternative proteins. And we typically have historically kind of broken those out into two different areas, one being plant-based, which we 
when what we mean when we say that is it's made entirely by plants with no animal products in it. The Beyond Meat Burger that we have here in the U.S. is a great example of that, but it's really meant to mimic the structure and taste of conventional meat with um, innovations in plant ingredients and plant ingredient processing. Cultivated meat, on the other hand, is produced by, it's sometimes called clean meat historically or cell-based meat. It's done by taking a small sample of animal cells and actually kind of replicating them in a culture outside of the animal. And you end up with what is 100% real meat, but produced without the animal, without the slaughter, and um, hopefully in a much more kind of efficient way. And there's lots of really interesting possibilities there. Uh, likely not new news for you, but just so that you're aware, we kind of typically think of those two. Why do we fund research though? Um, we have these two areas of innovation. We know that alternative proteins are a possible catalyst for creating a better food future. Uh, we've realized that the alternative protein industries generally, uh, they depend really heavily on continued R&D efforts. And we've seen that those efforts have been siloed across lots of different country, countries, lots of different companies, lots of different people are pursuing the same kind of fundamental questions, foundational science in siloed areas, they're wasting as a result a lot of money. And we wanted to kind of coordinate some of those basic efforts with through high quality research and produce the production of open access data that will hopefully enable the entire industry to, to lift up as a whole. And then the company by company, country by country, you can lead with those uh, later innovations that really define the value proposition for certain companies, et cetera. Um, but building the foundation of this healthy, sustainable, and just global food system is really why we fund research in the first place. We primarily fund research through research grants. We have done these for the past three years or so, and they really have served to increase the visibility of the industry and of the researchers who receive those grants. They validate certain scientific principles underlying the industry and what the future of the industry will be, in particular with cultivated meat. They grow a global scientific network and they create a lot of kind of excitement around these ideas. We've, we've been thankful to see lots of people kind of rally uh, around the projects that we're funding. And we've seen lots of momentum building up with this. And finally, we encourage the cultivation of new ideas and the formation of academic research centers that really capitalize on the massive opportunity the alternative proteins face um, that those represent in different places around the world. So we're able to kind of catalyze this a little bit through our research grants. How do we fund research though? Okay, we, we offer some grants, but what does that really look like? We primarily offer funding through three different mechanisms and I will be talking mostly around the first item here, the competitive research grant. That's our oldest to date. Those are our largest awards. Um, those awards typically um, are capped at around $250,000 US and uh, you know, have a maximum duration of about 24 months or two years. The RFP for that, uh, we'll drop a link later. I'll talk much more about it, but the first um, deadline around that is March 10th for phase one proposals. So that is our currently open RFP that is most largest and likely what most of you are, are interested in hearing a little bit more about. We do offer, we started last year offering some smaller, more tailored awards uh, called white space collaborations for about $100,000 in 12 months. And those are really about a specific uh, research problem that we're hoping someone solves, and we get proposals based off of that. We also offer for smaller bits of work, discrete pieces of work that are um, particularly interesting and relevant for individuals to hear, uh, but require a little bit less funding. We offer exploratory grants. Exploratory grants, as you can tell from this kind of right side chart, are always open. There's no there's no deadline necessarily for that. The white space collaborations come in periodically throughout the year. We don't have one currently open because we're focusing on that competitive research grant, um, which again, as I said, the deadline for is the uh, March 10th. All this said, bad news potentially, what do we not fund? Uh, we do not fund research on insect farming, human subject research, even just including research that depends entirely on sensory panels, uh, market research, 
consumer preference studies, those types of economic studies or LCAs. I can get into a little bit um, individually or offline why that is, but uh, we are really focused on the key technological and scientific barriers facing alternative proteins. These are um, these generally fall outside of the scope of our research funding. But who is eligible? Um, likely you is the answer. Uh, any sector is open. These are not just academic grants. These can go to governments, um, potentially. They can go to industry players, you know, startups, companies. They go to nonprofits, et cetera. Any researcher involved in this and to countries around the world. So I understand most of our audience is tuning in from Israel today. Um, you are absolutely encouraged to apply, obviously. And some of you are in Europe as well. Totally fine, the restriction around, around that. Uh, and if you feel there might be a restriction, feel free to reach out to us individually. I have contact information at the end of this. On that last note, talking about who's eligible, many have noted that startups might be looking for funding, um, but that might seem at odds or that it can get a little confusing with GFI's support of open access research. And I thought it would be useful to highlight five principles that we kind of adhere to when we're thinking about intellectual property on our research grants. We are, I will say first off, we are 100% um, behind commercialization of research. We ultimately want research to not sit on bookshelves. That's the goal. We want this to go out into the industry and really change the world. That's, that's why we exist. That's why I have a job is to help do this. So in order to make this most possible, whether we're offering funding to a government agency, an academic center, or a startup, we typically have joint ownership of IP just for the scope of work that we fund. That is to ensure that those findings are disseminated adequately throughout. We obviously get no background IP, anything that you did prior to GFI's funding, we obviously don't own that, or anything that you, you can build on that scope of work that we funded and continue to develop that in your proprietary efforts, that's perfectly fine. But for that scope of work, we do second, um, promote the publication and public dissemination. Most often that looks like a uh, publication in an open access journal, a peer reviewed journal ideally, but we can work with you on the specific details of that. We are fine with patents, that's okay. Uh, we kind of encourage them honestly within certain uh, boundaries. And to ensure that the findings are distributed widely and we're um, promoting the industry to the best uh, to the best of our ability, as well as you as a grant recipient, uh, we make sure that non-commercial licenses are um, available to be offered to others just for research purposes. Um, those are royalty free. So if, if an academic center wants to validate your results or continue diving into certain things, they absolutely should have the right to do that. And if there's a commercial license that you're hoping to license out the technology to different companies that want to build on it or something, we ask that those are done in a non-exclusive manner. Again, just to ensure that research efforts are not maintaining their siloed hist historical patterns that we're really building a new industry. And we can get into specific questions uh, later in the Q&A section or individually as well. I will put my email again. Next, it might be useful to go over what GFI has funded to date. Um, we have awarded during our life uh, just over $7 million, which is, I'm really proud of that number, to 37 researchers in 13 countries across five continents. This is really a global effort. And I wish this were 70 million uh, over <laughs> to 370 researchers, right? But uh, we're working really diligently to try to increase the amount of funding available for this research. We recognize that our contribution is not adequate. Uh, we wish that others joined us in this effort, some governments joined us in this effort, but um, we're doing our best to promote this in a really global way and make sure that there's access to these resources around the world. Particular to this audience, we have a couple Israeli grantees that we're really, really thrilled with their work, um, both working, as you can tell, on cultivated meat, on uh, you know characterizing quinoa, on, on plant-based ingredients, on plant-based uh, fermentation of, of ingredients, on texturization of plant-based ingredients. There's lots of really exciting research going on in, in Israel. We are very well aware of that. And um, we're really excited to be engaging with you all today. So thanks for coming again. 
as I mentioned earlier, most of you are looking at the 2021 or uh, competitive research grant to make sure I get my years right. 2020 blew by so quickly. I keep <laughs> having gaffes and saying the wrong year. Um, but most of you are looking at this larger RFP, the phase one deadline for which is March 10th. This RFP is really seeking to advance the science of whole cuts of alternative proteins. That's our primary goal. So what does that mean? These are some terrible um, icons to show you that generally we're looking for whole products, not necessarily ground meat. Uh, not, we're not looking to make uh, sausages or ground burgers. Um, those are really popular here in the US and they're great products, but we feel that there are sufficient technological barriers to producing that next generation of ingredients. So if it's you know, chicken breast analogs, um, pork chop analogs, uh, salmon fillets, that type of um, that type of ingredient steaks. That's really what we're looking for. That doesn't mean on the cultivated side, for instance, that we will only fund work focused on structuring. For example, to produce a cut of salmon, cultivated salmon, there are a lot of steps in between that we still need to figure out and that there's a lot of research that needs to be done. It's not just the scaffolding section. And that's really important. It could, your work for this RFP to address this ultimate end goal of whole cuts could fit in at lots of different stages throughout the production process. And that's perfectly fine. And we understand that we're open to your suggestions and ideas as to what would be most impactful, but we're ultimately looking for things that will enable the production of whole cut products. It doesn't mean at the end of your $250,000 research, uh, research grant, you have to hand us a chicken breast on a plate and we would do a taste test to validate whether you were successful or not. That's not at all um, the end goal. But we're looking for the data, processes, tools, and technologies that will ultimately allow the industry to break past just ground products and um, advance into this kind of next generation of ingredients. It's a massive part of the meat industry as a whole and as our, of our food system. Most of the products we eat are not simply ground and we need the alternative protein industry to reflect that and ultimately meet that need. How you actually apply for this should be relatively straightforward. Uh, we'll drop the link for this in the chat, of course, um, but it's relatively straightforward. GFI.org slash research grants is generally where you can find most of the information about our research grants program. You can find the RFP there based on the RFP if you read through, if you have any questions, there's contact information throughout that. You can download directly from that an editable proposal template, and it has a link right there to submit your proposal. It should be relatively straightforward, but if anything is unclear at any point or, for, or if you have specific questions, there's contact information listed throughout that document. Feel free to reach out to me individually. Uh, happy to help with anything as you're going through and developing your proposals. The next kind of common question we get is how, once you submit your proposal, how is it actually evaluated? What do I need to be looking out for? And we primarily look at five different um, criteria when evaluating your proposal. We have a panel of different scientific reviewers, multi-phase process to ensure that there's no bias throughout it. Um, it's a really rigorous review process and we're really happy with that process, but they're primarily looking at five things if we're going to bucket it down. First is the scientific alignment. Are you solving a key technological barrier in the industry? How is this work aligned with the industry progress as a whole? Second is the expected impact. Is this something that is really going to be game changing? Is it going to be sufficient to move the needle in the right direction for the industry? Third, what's the plan with the contribution to the scientific community? Are you publishing your work, uh, disseminating the findings widely as seen? Is this a need for the scientific community as well as just industry? Um, fourth is project planning. How well is the, is the team suited to meet the project goals? How clearly and logically are the objectives outlined in the proposal? What does the methodology look like to achieve those objectives? Are you really driving towards your final result as, as a team. We recognize there's a certain amount of exploration in any research project, but we'd love to see that clarity up front. And finally, as I mentioned before, commercial relevance. How commercially relevant is your project? Is this something that not only is going to advance the science, but ultimately, is it possible that this could assist us with actually meeting market demand uh, going into the world and uh, actually changing the industry and changing what we're able to eat as consumers? 
Finally, if you need research ideas, um, we have a solutions database. There's some recommendations in the RFP for potential ideas you might wanna look at, but if you need a little bit more uh, thinking behind or a little bit more uh, supplementary information behind your proposal, if you'd like to dive into that a little bit further, we have a solutions database where you can discover some different ideas. These were crowdsourced from tons and tons of people throughout the industry throughout the world. And that's at uh, Alternative Protein Solutions. That I believe is also linked in the RFP as well. And that's the 101 for uh, research grants <laughs> from GFI. I would love to open this up generally to more questions and I will just leave this on a contact us page so that you can write down emails if, if that's useful. Um, but I'd love to open it up for your questions. I know we may have gotten a couple in during the Q&A while I was talking. Thanks very much, Austin. Hi, everyone. Um, as McCall mentioned at the beginning, my name is Erin, and I work closely with Austin on our program. And so I will help um, with the Q&A section here. Um, Again, please feel free to, to drop your, your questions in the Q&A and we will do our best um, to answer them for you. Um, the first question we have gotten, um, greetings from Spain, hello, um, is asking, has some of the research funded by GFI been published already? Um, the answer to that is yes. We have had um, two grantees publish uh, their results so far. Um, a group from the Biosense Institute um, in Serbia has published uh, at least one paper on the work that they've been doing to develop sensors that um, can be fitted to uh, bioreactors for cultivated meat um, to help sense waste products and metabolites. On the plant-based side, we've had a paper published from a group um, in Estonia, the Center for Food and Fermentation Technologies, um, looking at fermentation of oat protein and the use of that as an ingredient for plant-based meat products. Um, happy to share direct links to those papers if you'd like to reach out to us directly. Um, we've had a few additional grantees publish some review articles um, within their area of expertise and are looking for um, additional papers to be published this year. As I'm sure you all know, um, 2020 was challenging um, with the, the pandemic and resulted in many researchers being able, not being able to um, move forward with their research as quickly as they were hoping. Um, but we are anticipating um, that we'll be seeing some more publications from our grantees um, in 2021. Um, Austin, maybe I'll pass this question over to you. Um, you're being thanked for your presentation. Um, and this person is asking, can multiple entities apply for the same grant? Um, I, I think that, I think maybe that means, um, can the same person put in multiple proposals? Um, yeah. If I'm not correct, please follow up. Um, to make sure that we get your question answered. Yeah, uh, it, it is a good question. It's come up a couple times. Um, I think the, the general rule is yes, you can technically, uh, you can submit more than one um, proposal. However, we do really ask that they be materially different from one another. That's kind of the criteria for if you should consider applying two different proposals. If, for instance, you have two very separate um, scopes of work. One is uh, engagement with a plant-based meat company on their ingredient optimization or something. And then the other, you're helping build plant-based scaffolds for cultivated meat, something along those lines where there's different partners, different scopes of work. That's maybe an extreme example, but um, as a general rule, you might consider how materially different those projects are and how different those collaborations and partnerships are uh, before submitting more than one proposal. Um, we would ask that for any singular group, uh, where it's the exact same research team, you likely not submit more than one. Um, 
if it's just the exact same group of you know four or five researchers considering three or four different project proposals that they think might be interesting. Uh, if you're in that situation, I would ask that perhaps you just get in touch with us prior to submitting um, these multiple ones and we can maybe help you prioritize, which is potentially the most impactful. Thanks, Austin. Um, that is a question that we get fairly frequently. Um, we did get clarification on the question um, that I asked and it is, can three companies work on the same project? Um, and we are very much in favor of collaboration. Um, we are happy to see groups coming together um, to submit work and um, that, is, that is totally acceptable. Um, we are also happy to try and help you find collaborators. I can't promise that we will always be successful with that, but we do have a fairly extensive network of scientists working in this space. And if there is a particular area of expertise that you need for your desired project, um, we would be happy to try and introduce you to people who um, may be interested in collaborating. So yes, please feel, feel free to, to partner um, with others on your projects. Um, another question is how close does the project need to be funded? Um, I don't know that I exactly understand what that is asking unless they mean, um, unless you mean how close to commercialization. Um, and again, please, please add additional information if I have not understood the question correctly. Um, we fund basic science, so you don't need to feel like your project itself needs to be close to commercialization. Um, but we would ask you to demonstrate how down the line um, this project would be valuable to furthering the science and the industry. Um, Austin, are cold cuts of turkey or ham um, eligible? So, so cold cut products or only steak-like? Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. Um, and I assume you mean by cold cuts, you mean like deli slices of meat or something like that. If that's not exactly what you mean, just let me know. But um, I would say those could be potentially interesting. I would give the caveat, however, that I think as far as our reasoning behind choosing whole cuts as, as a focus, uh, being that it's a massive part of the meat market globally, cold cuts simply represent a smaller portion of the global meat consumption um, around the globe. And because of that, I would think that they're not generally as high priority as things like steaks or chicken breasts or pork loins or um, other kind of that type of warm whole cut product uh, that can be a little bit more diverse in its applications. Could be potentially interesting if you have something that is uh, that you think is particularly impactful. As I said before, feel free to reach out directly and we can discuss offline. But I would say generally, um, we're likely less interested a little bit in deli slices or things along those lines and more interested in products that could apply to a you know, vast, diverse uh, global meat market. Thanks, Austin. We have several questions asking us to reconcile this um, need for open access with our acceptance of, of patent applications. And I think that this is the most common question we get and certainly one that, that deserves some time and attention. Um, sometimes it can be difficult again to really get into this in a general way. So as Austin has mentioned multiple times, please feel free to reach out to us directly and we can talk about um, your specific situation. Um, as Austin mentioned, our goal is really to help the entire industry. And um, by US law as a nonprofit, we have to make sure that we are not um, showing significant, significant private benefit to one specific company. Um, so this is how we've attempted to reconcile those needs with the fact that um, we don't want to prevent anyone from um, patenting or protecting IP that might be generated out of our research. And sometimes it's difficult to know ahead of time 
whether that will will happen or not. Um, so we certainly don't want to, to penalize anyone for that. Um, when we talk about open access, what we mean by that is that um, the, the results and the work will be shared, um, but it doesn't mean that a part of that can't be licensing a technology. So we still see that as, as sharing that technology. So it doesn't mean that everything you're sharing has to be completely free. Um, so I, I think um, to try and give some examples, um, one of the um, startups that we have funded in the past is Tropic. They are a startup here in the US that is working on seaweed protein. Um, they have existing IP. Um, they are looking to develop more IP around um, the methodology that they're developing to extract these proteins. The work we funded and what they will be sharing um, will be data on the characterization of several different varieties of red seaweeds. Um, so what is the protein content of those seaweeds? What is the functionality of protein extracted from that seaweed? So they were able to come up with um, a, a body of work that is helpful to them. They need to know all of this information um, that we feel is helpful to the industry um, so that it will provide some, some background information on um, these seaweeds and seaweed proteins um, for others that may be interested in this space, but doesn't jeopardize um, you know, their company and the proprietary work that they're trying to do. Um, I hope that helps. I don't wanna go into to too many details, but again, feel free to reach out to us directly if you have questions about your situation. Um, I think there are often ways we can um, find a, a part of work that will be relevant um, to the, the company um, and, and meet our mission. So I hope that my answer helps a little bit. Austin, did you have anything that you wanted to add on this topic? No, I think that's a good summary. Uh, I see that there's another question just about the development of a new technology and what um, ownership of that IP looks like and, and commercialization. And I think Aaron's point about Trophic as an example is, is kind of spot on. Essentially, how we've treated this in the past with, with startups and what I think is most effective is if the researcher is able to carve out a discrete piece of work that they need to do anyway, it's going to be a part of their R&D efforts, but would be uh, kind of universally beneficial and globally applicable were it to be open access, that is a great candidate. And likely that particular scope of work is not necessarily going to be the singular or most important um, driver of value for their company. So Trophic, as an example here, they need to do this characterization. It's not ultimately what is going to determine whether or not they are a successful company. They have to do quite a bit more work to develop a product afterwards, um, either sell it to other markets, et cetera. You could provide ancillary um, uh, examples for other industries, other companies, but that general model, I think is, is kind of spot on as far as how to think of it. Um, that discrete piece of work is basically what's shared. You're welcome and encouraged to develop beyond it as a company and um, And I will just say that, you know, GFI exists to support the industry. We don't want to do anything that is going to harm um, startups that are trying to make a difference in this space. Again, our um, requirement for shared IP is not because we want to, to take that and commercialize it, um, but it's a way for us to kind of make sure that, um, you know, in the unfortunate situation that the company, you know, would cease to exist, um, that we can still make sure that that, that work does get out um, and is utilized by the industry. But certainly um, our hope is that you would be successful um, with the work that you're doing and you would be able to, to take that and, and move on and, and commercialize it. Um, and again, I really encourage you to reach out um, so that we can talk in more detail about your specific situation um, and hopefully get to a place that, that feels comfortable for you um, and still meets our requirements. Mm -hmm. There are a few questions about funding rate. Um, 
based on the past couple years, we end up funding about 15% of the proposals um, that we receive. Um, I don't have those numbers broken down by um, academia and industry, but if you're really interested in that, um, we'd be happy to figure that out for you. Um, in general, the majority of our proposals come from universities um, or government researchers, um, and I think that's primarily due to this open access focus. Um, we, on the private sector side, we typically see proposals from startups. Um, I actually can't recall us getting any proposals from larger um, existing industry uh, companies. We do not limit the number of partners. Um, we really wanna see research teams that um, have the right amount of expertise for what the project has proposed. Um, sometimes that requires two people. Sometimes it requires five. Um, there's, there's no limit or set number on that. Um, it really depends on the, the scope of work um, and the expertise that people bring. So we're not looking for big research groups. We're not looking for small ones. We wanna see um, just that you have the people that you need. Um, we do typically limit our competitive grant projects to two years. Um, but again, if there is a specific reason you would need more time, um, we'd be happy to, to consider your, your specific um, situation. Um, again, I think depending on kind of where along the technology readiness level spectrum your project falls, um, it may be more difficult for you to say, this is how this research would be commercialized. Um, so we are totally open to funding work in the TRL levels one through three, um, or you know, further up in the, the middle range or, or closer to commercialization. Um, I think one of the key things to think about, again, we really wanna see value to the industry as a whole. So sometimes earlier on in the technology readiness levels, um, the work is more foundational and could maybe have a broader impact across the industry. Um, for instance, you know, if you're working on just figuring out a few little formulation tweaks or something for you know, an end product that you want to sell, that's gonna be maybe a lot more specific just to your situation um, versus the industry. Um, again, please, if, if we're not doing an adequate job answering your question, please um, try and restate it or, or ask again, and, and we'll try and make sure that we're, that we're doing that. Um, Austin, a question here. If you submit a proposal for the competitive grant RFP and it doesn't make the funding cut, can you submit proposals for the white space or exploratory grants in the same year? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and thanks for the question. We get this often. Uh, we have grantees who have won our uh, competitive research grants in the past and have gone on to win exploratory grants in the future for different pieces of work that are um, kind of entirely separate, but still beneficial. Um, so absolutely, I mean, not only if you don't receive funding under one RFP, are you welcome to apply for future funding? Absolutely. Uh, even if you do win this, um, should you in another year or something along those lines uh, decide that you would like to carry on additional different work, uh, you're welcome to apply for that funding as well. So yeah, you're not restricted in any way from applying for other funding. Another question about how to reconcile open access with approving patent applications. Um, and just one additional thing I wanna add is that I think um, part of it is it can be helpful to think about the project as a whole. So um, we do have one grantee so far who has submitted a patent application for um, a piece of their project. Um, so their project had three aims um, and one part of one aim is, is kind of what, what they're looking to patent. Um, and so again, I think what that shows is that the, the the majority of the work um, is, is all open access and there is one piece um, that they're looking to patent and it will be something that, um, assuming that it 
gets patented would, um, you know, that they would look to, to license out non-exclusively. So to me, that feels fundamentally different than a project that is really focused specifically on, you know, producing a, a new prototype um, piece of equipment that would be the, the primary um, IP of, of a company or, you know, so, so I think um, part of it is, is the overall scope of the project and how much of that um, would be patent, patentable um, versus not. Um, thank you for all of these questions. Is there a grant more specifically aimed at PhD students already doing a project in cultivated meat? Um, Austin, do you wanna to speak to that? Yeah, I'm happy to. Uh, I mean, first these, I would just mention um, and clarify that these awards under this competitive research grant RFP, uh, you are eligible as a, as a PhD student to apply for that, particularly if you have a faculty advisor that you're working with um, throughout the duration of that you're absolutely welcome to. However, if you're looking for, if I'm understanding this question correctly, and if you're looking for something that's perhaps a little bit shorter term and um, is a little bit smaller in scale potentially, uh, I would point you towards the exploratory grants mechanism that we, that we have. Um, that in particular, I think could be a very good, interesting fit. And there's another question about the timeline for those as well. So I'll just toss that in. They are uh, reviewed relatively quickly and awards are given pretty quickly. So shouldn't be more than a few months at absolute most um, from when you submit a proposal to when you get word back as to whether GFI would fund that small bit of, of research or not. So that might be particularly interesting for PhD students. Um, as far as sponsoring the entirety of a of a PhD tenure or something, we don't have any specific awards just dedicated to that. But um, so it would all have to be couched within the greater scope of your project, what you're ultimately researching. Um, but that might be an interesting uh, approach you could take. And if you have any questions in particular, feel free to reach out. Thanks, Austin. Um, let's see. Uh, so there's a question here. If developing a prototype for a scalable production principle of 3D cultured meat constructs, does it have to work under sterile conditions and with cells, or is it enough to prove the principle with the resulting prototype? Yeah, so I think, um, and, and this kind of ties in maybe a little bit to the next question, which again, just gets back to this um, limit on technology readiness levels. Um, and, and is there a certain TRL that we're looking for? And uh, we're open, we fund projects kind of across the spectrum. So certainly if you are earlier stage, we recognize that, um, you know, it may be just a, a prototype project. Um, and if it's, you're not yet at a point where you can get it to work under sterile conditions. Um, that in itself isn't a reason why we would say this project is ineligible. Um, we, on the cultivated meat side, um, do tend to get um, several proposals that use mouse cells um, for, I think, obvious reasons um, on the scientific side. Um, people have more experience using mouse cells. They're more widely available. Um, and in those cases, we really do um, often try and encourage researchers to think about, you know, is this a project that, you know, we could use um, bovine cells or, you know, an agriculturally relevant cell line with. Um, and certainly, if you're able to incorporate that, I think that makes the, the project stronger. Um, but because we're open to research along the technology readiness level spectrum, we recognize that some people will be working um, where they can do it with bovine cells under sterile conditions. Um, and other people may be earlier along um, and need to just kind of get that proof of concept work done. Um, so the, the stage of the work um, is not going to be a determining factor for us. It's going to be um, those five criteria that Austin mentioned about, you know, impact, um, and, and things like that. Um, 
Is it a must to focus on whole cuts? What about projects focusing on the production of microbial protein, like fungal single cell protein that has a fibrous structure like meat, but is not a true alternative to certain meat products? Um, Austin, do you wanna take that one or? Yeah, I'm happy to. Uh, and if I miss anything, if you disagree, uh, feel free to add on. This is really interesting. Um, this is coming from Lena. Uh, so in the case of microbial proteins, fungal single cell proteins, fiber structure like meat, uh, I think you could expand this out even beyond this particular um, application. And as I said, it's, it's not necessarily that we're looking at the end of your research for you to have a final product. Uh, we recognize that's not realistic and uh, that's not even desirable in many ways. Uh, so if this research, if microbial proteins um, you think could help in the future enable the industry to better meet the diverse needs of the meat industry, that I think is by itself, um, I, that would make it eligible. And that's kind of an interesting application of this. I would ask for this RFP. I think the, the thing that you have to keep in mind, I'd ask you to keep in mind is how this research ultimately would lead to um, greater ability of the industry to produce whole cut products. It's not necessarily that you have to develop that product right away, um, but is your is one of the problems that your research is solving is one of those related to ultimately being able to better produce a diversity of alternative meat products. I think that's kind of the, that's the litmus test that we are going to be using, honestly, when we're looking at the scientific alignment of these and the expected impact of these proposals. Uh, it doesn't have to be the singular um, impact of your research. In fact, it's great if it's not, if uh, it would also make ground products um, improved and uh, better, uh, better products in the short term, like, wonderful. I'm not at all going to complain about that. But um, to be frank, I think a big litmus test is, could this in the future help the industry uh, better meet the demand for whole cut products? I think that's a good test. And so if you feel that microbial proteins have that, um, if you feel like they pass that litmus test, I would absolutely encourage you to, to kind of continue thinking about that. And as I said, if you want to really get into specifics on your um, thinking, feel free to reach out directly and we can connect one-on-one -on -one and get a little bit further into the weeds. Yeah, but certainly um, we, we talk a lot about plant-based and cultivated products. Um, and clearly microbial organisms are not plants, but um, I think on the fermentation side, um, you know, we recognize there's um, a lot of possibility for microbial proteins to play a role um, in alternative meat products. And so I think that, um, it, yeah, on a, on a very general level, yes, that is within scope. Um, and we're happy to talk about more details. Um, a couple additional questions here. So um, our grant is indeed a, a grant. It is not an investment. So we award out the money and we do not um, expect to take equity in a company or um, you know, want ownership in the company um, or ask you to, to pay anything back. Um, it is a, a true grant award. Um, in the RFP, um, you can. There's a link to uh, our starting contract. So if you are really interested in seeing, you know, what is this legal contract going to look like, you're welcome to to take a look at that ahead of time. Um, I will say that um, we have negotiated uh, slightly different terms than what that standard contract is with with some of our grantees. So again. Um, I really encourage you not to let the legal side of this um, scare you away. Um, please do reach out to us. If there's any way we can um, find something that is mutually beneficial, we will, we will certainly try and do that. Um, the one place where there may be royalties um, is if there is a part of your project that gets patented and you license that out, um, we do ask for royalties. Um, typically, 
paying back the amount of the grant. Um, and that is just one way that we can kind of continue um, funding this program um, and getting more research funded. Um, but again, all of that is, is kind of spelled out in the, in the grant contract. Um, finally, is the scaling up of the technology for protection of whole cuts something that you would be looking into? Um, yes, Austin, do you wanna add anything to that? Uh, no, I mean, it's a relatively vague question right on the, on the face of it. I would say, uh, yeah, ab absolutely. That seems something like um, we're obviously interested in production of whole cuts and we're ob obviously introduced, uh, interested in scaling up production of alternative proteins to meet demand. That's a huge um, bottleneck in the industry and it's going to be very difficult should we uh, be really successful in the industry. Uh, so I would say on the surface, absolutely. Um, if you, as I've said before, if you really wanna dive into specifics or if you have additional clarifications, like feel free to ask those, but um, on the surface, absolutely. Yeah, I think again, very high level and I wouldn't want anyone to feel like they're excluded from this statement, but um, you know, we really believe that some of the, the key um, scientific and technical needs for alternative proteins are in the sensory characteristics of these products. Um, if, if consumers don't like the taste or texture or, or smell, they're not gonna buy them. Um, the, the cost of these products, um, if they're too expensive, people can't buy them. Um, and then the scale, you know, if we're really wanting uh, plant-based and cultivated and fermentation derived meat products to help feed the world, we need to make sure that we can produce them at a high enough level that, that people have access to them. So at a very high level, I think those are the, the, the key um, driving needs that we're hoping to help address with the, the research that we're funding. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and just a quick piggyback off of that. If you feel in particular that your research is particularly well suited to, to uh, high scaling potential in the future, I, I would recommend you highlight that in your research proposal. It's something that definitely falls under the expected impact area that we are evaluating on proposals. And if it seems that one technology is particularly amenable to, to scaling and high kind of throughput and meeting actual demand, then that's something that if you feel it's it's particularly relevant for your proposal, absolutely highlight that because that's a that's definite plus for us. I believe we have gotten through the questions. Um, those were really great. Thank you all for your engagement, and I hope that our answers have been helpful. Um, I yeah. guess, Nicole, I will turn it over to you um, to wrap up unless there are any final questions. It looks like we have a few minutes left. Any questions left? So I'll just say um, thank you very, very much, Erin and Austin, for um, the great presentation and all the time to answer all the great questions that raised during this presentation. Uh, I will say that if there are any other questions that you would like to discuss uh, privately or will raise up uh, during the process, during time, please don't hesitate to uh, address, to contact us or directly Austin and Erin and uh, we'll definitely answer all of the questions and assist in any way. So um, you have all the information and go to the uh, website and you have all the um, contact details and just um, reach out. Thank you. I hope this um, webinar was um, helpful and uh, we're um, waiting to see your proposals. So uh, good night, good evening, uh, good morning. <laughs> or, uh, thanks everybody. <laughs>